Paul Berry, after having taught for some years at the University of Michigan and the University of Washington, has been doing research, writing, and teaching in Japan since the late 1900s. He's been studying aspects <laughs> late 1990s, excuse me. I did not bring my reading glasses. I'm not a vampire. Uh, well, the life-sustaining uh, qualities of tea, clearly. Uh, OK. For the last several years, not decades, he's been a researcher on a Japanese government Kaken research grant involving the redefinition of Sensoga war painting and a melon curator at large for the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Today he will be presenting on the shrinking economic and cultural basis of Chanoyu and its impact on the nature of tea culture in Japan. Please join me in welcoming Paul Berry. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about uh, a lot of fascinating topics about agriculture, uh, uh, biochemistry, and uh, health benefits and other things. Uh, my talk is going to be quite different than that. Uh, uh, it's uh, about tea and not about tea at the same time, and that I'm really looking at the cultural complexes that have built up in Japan around tea. Uh, so, in some ways, you can attribute this to qualities of tea itself that we've talked about, but it's also about the interaction of uh, tea coming from China and uh, uh, largely from use in monastic traditions that largely died out in China, uh, but were uh, adopted into Japan and then continued there and, and went through a long process of adaptation. In fact, uh, the cultural manifestations that I want to talk about in Japan are so diverse and so exhaustive and so complicated that almost everything I'm going to say today is gross over, over generalization and simplification. So I hope you bear with me on that. I'd be uh, happy to go into details and questions uh, later on or, or even after uh, the symposium. But to uh, leap into the, the topic here, uh, before uh, talking about the details, just a few terms that some of you may be familiar with, but I'll uh, touch on it just the same. Uh, these are uh, uh, terms that, uh, <clears throat> taking uh, Japanese tea broadly uh, speaking and putting into three categories of consumption, um, the one type of tea, so this matcha connected to the Chanyu uh, practices, are the ones that acquired the greatest cultural ramifications in terms of philosophy, aesthetics, and impact in all kinds of uh, applied arts and fine arts uh, in Japan. Uh, that uh, generically, the, the leaves that are, are being going to be used for matcha are called tencha, and then in matcha, and when drinking, uh, it's in two different uh, categories of koicha and usucha. Koicha is the old practice. Uh, it still continues in a modified form today. It's a very thick tea, in fact. Um, a lot of people wouldn't even recognize that it is tea because it's, it's, uh, it's almost like a uh, consistency of a thick soup, yeah. and uh, that type of tea practice, you would you would uh, uh, not each have your own bowl, but if there's like five people, you would all take one uh, sip from the same bowl and pass it around. So it's a very communal uh, activity of everybody drinking from the same bowl, and uh, much of the tea history pre-19th century was around that practice. But in 19th century, uh, gradually the idea of usucha or thin, chi, uh, thin uh, matcha, like what we had out here in the hall, has become the standard type of uh, matcha, which is much uh, thinner. And in a tea ceremony, everybody would have their own bowl and drink a, a full uh, bowl. Uh, more recently, there's all kinds of products that I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Uh, there, uh, Tea, matcha flavored chocolate, ice cream, uh, candy, all kinds of things. That has a kind of matcha in it. It's a new development uh, commercially in the industry. It's called moga. Uh, uh, real matcha is, is still sort of uh, 
the, particularly the higher grades, is a hand-produced product that's very time-consuming uh, to make it industrialized for cooking. Uh, it has to be industrially produced, greatly simplified, and actually, although in a certain sense it's a, a powder to tea, it's, um, it's, uh, it's very crude and rough compared to the refined matcha, and it has to be crude and rough, so the flavor is extremely strong that will hold up under cooking, uh, because the refined matcha, the flavor is so delicate that it gets pretty almost vanishes in cooking. And so this, uh, the chocolates and all these other kinds of things are using moga, uh, which, uh, so uh, matcha production is actually switching more towards MOGA because it has all of these commercial applications and doesn't have to be part of a tea ceremony. Uh, Sencha is also another huge uh, phenomenon, but it started much later in, in the Edo period and it really became uh, big in the 19th century and is still large in the 20th century. It has its own uh, ceremonial aspects and so forth. Uh, it has a rich aesthetics as well, but, uh, and it's actually one of the things I've especially studied, but I'm not going to talk about it much today because I'm, what I'm really talking about for the tea world is the matcha world uh, today. Uh, and then uh, the sencha, though, in that second category is different from the sencha in the third category because the third category is talked about um, uh, mass-produced uh, drinks that are bottled and canned. And, and the biggest expansion of tea in modern Japan is this sort of industrialized uh, mass consumption tea and pet bottles and other things that are sold everywhere and have a large popularity. Uh, so in any case, that's just a little terminological background. but. Uh, uh, going, uh, although tea, uh, uh, in terms of uh, matcha, uh, came into Japan, there's a lot of uh, vagarities of the traditional uh, stories and actual history that don't always match, but we can think of it as something becoming popular in around the 13th century. But when you say popular, it would have been very restricted, very small quantities, just beginning to be grown. Originally it was just imported, but around the uh, Kama Kura period it's believed that actual tea cultivation was beginning, but it was confined to monasteries, uh, uh, cultural elites, things around uh, uh, shoguns and uh, some imperial use. Uh, it wasn't until uh, several centuries later that it, uh, in the late Muromachi and the Momoyama periods in like the 16th century, that it starts broadening out and really taking uh, a, a broader route, though it's still a very high class activity in terms of the social strata. But it's at that point that it develops not only a rich philosophy, and particularly in relationship to Buddhism, and especially Zen, but uh, uh, also developing architecture like tea houses, like this famous one here associated with Rikyu. Uh, and uh, it's from that time period that ceramics and all kinds of art forms become shooting off in every direction. Uh, uh, the tea is associated in terms of uh, uh, works not only with drinking tea, but with kaiseki. Uh, and that's the sort of supreme uh, level of Japanese cuisine that was uh, consumed as a part of a tea ceremony. It wasn't just drinking uh, tea, you would have maybe three or four hours where you'd have uh, uh, several different types of tea during the process, but also a variety of uh, food. This, the food, and, and sometimes there's even uh, wine consumed and other things, would be be brought in one at a time uh, so that uh, all the utensils wouldn't be grouped together like this. It's taking the utensils from a whole session and putting them together in a way that they wouldn't actually be done during the ceremony. But it gives you some idea of the diversity of utensils. Um, when we look at uh, the 17th century, the ceramics really exploded in all kinds of diverse ways. Uh, we don't have time to even touch on it, but this is a, uh, uh, a famous example of a a Shino bowl from around the Goya area, and uh, the qualities of this are in great contrast to uh, a bowl by Ninsei, that's uh, roughly the same time period, and these, uh, this contrast between overglaze enamels and, and a kind of a, a low-fired earthenware uh, are extremely different, but are still part of the same uh, world of uh, Chanayu and, and tea cultivation. Uh, tea craft uh, cultivation around the tea ceremony in Japan. Uh, tea uh, became such a huge uh, item in high cultural circles in Japan that even the ceramic kilns in China took notice of this and started making uh, uh, 
Chinese ceramics, not for Chinese consumption, but f entirely for export for Japan. And so this is a, a blue and white uh, hiire, or this is for holding charcoal for smoking uh, in those long pipes you may have seen in ukiyo-e prints or in, in movies. Uh, uh, any case, uh, this uh, is constructed, even the humorous figure put on the side, is. Uh, to match export taste for Japan. So it's a, a rarefied part of uh, Chinese production for uh, Japanese tea-related activities. Uh, all kinds of dramatic uh, 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 ceramic uh, developments happen. This is uh, Takatori ware from Kyushu. Uh, this kind of abstraction that we find here uh, had an enormous impact on 20th century worldwide uh, sort of art ceramic production and brought lots of people from around the world to Japan to study this kind of aesthetic. This is a handled tray that would, would hold uh, food items for passing around during uh, a tea ceremony. This is that same tray looking on the side. So it looks like it's flat, but it's actually on a circular base. And there are a lot of interesting uh, aspects about it. This, this too is uh, early 17th century. Uh, <clears throat> when we think about uh, the tea world, though, in Japan, one of the things that uh, uh, is uh, very important, and I've mentioned it repeatedly already, is its high cultural status. Uh, particularly, even today, uh, uh, the most important tea ceremony of the year is the uh, Hatsugama, the first tea of the year. And uh, even today, a, a long, well, how long is at least half a century or more uh, of uh, tradition that the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, and here we see Abe actually, uh, uh, I think this is actually early this year, uh, there's a Hatsugame for Ur Urasenke, it's the sort of the, the dominant of a number of different uh, schools uh, of tea in Japan, uh, has a Hatsugame practice in Kyoto and then in Tokyo, and Tokyo major politicians, it used to be heads of companies, the major companies. In fact, there was competition to be who was at the Hatsugami. If you go back into 1970s and 80s and you're looking at the in TV, uh, Japanese TV uh, news, one of the news items would be, who's at the Urasenke Hatsugami? Because it's kind of a pecking order of who's who in elite society. Uh, however, Part of the changes I'm going to talk about is why that's still going on to some degree. Its prominence has dropped until uh, uh, it's sort of a minor newspaper article rather than a headlining thing in, in uh, television news. But it still continues this way. And it shows um, uh, uh, that tea is not only a social and artistic thing, but has a, a very large uh, political uh, meaning as well in Japan, although that too is uh, diminishing. And what we want to talk about now is uh, uh, a pyramidal structure of, uh, of uh, tea schools and tea practice in Japan that um, had always existed to a degree, but I think is, uh, took on very large social and economic uh, a role in post-war Japan. You had the developing middle class, and the middle class, as they started gaining more money, took on ambitions of, of you know, rising in cultural status, and that was in tandem with uh, something called omiyai, which is the arranged marriage system. So in the 50s, 60s, particularly in the 60s and 70s, and started diminishing a little 80, is now almost vanishing. Uh, the idea of omiyai, and which was uh, 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 men were supposed to be good candidates because of their family background or their prospects for educational or business success. Uh, women were supposed to uh, uh, develop uh, measures of refinement that are associated in the West with what used to be called finishing school, uh, where high, so-called uh, high-class women would go to special schools to train themselves in etiquette and other things. Uh, study in tea was being used for young women in, in, by the millions in, in, uh, in the 60s and 70s. So we had a uh, pyramidal structure of tea with an Iemoto, uh, the, the founder, the head of the whole system at the top, and then a uh, high-ranking, uh, largely male coterie under that, and then moving down to different layers of the broad base, which uh, uh, was millions of young women 
uh, taking part in tea, not with an ambition of becoming a tea teacher or, or really continuing it in an active way for the rest of their lives, but doing it for three or four years to make themselves more attractive and higher quality in sort of the arranged marriage system. Uh, and so that provided an enormous economic engine for making tea having a large financial base that then helped the individual school spread influence throughout society. But as OMI practices and, uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, though the idea of a so-called love ma match was growing as an ideal, most people thought that would never happen, and, and there was a huge percentage of women were still being uh, uh, you know, part of the arranged marriage system, as were the men, of course, but uh, uh, the, it made this pyramid then largely female at the bottom, and as you went higher and higher, it became more and more male. Uh, and uh, pyramid structures work uh, if you can replace the base. If all the base people want to go to the top, everything falls apart. You know? But if you have a, an army that keeps replacing itself at the bottom, if you have a university that keeps replacing the students at the bottom, you have a pyramid structure that can maintain itself and move forward. But what's happening in uh, tea culture with the disappearance of the OMI system and the if you went to Japan and you talked to uh, women in college today and ask if you're doing tea or they know anyone doing tea, or you ask whether they're going to be involved in OMI, uh, not only would they be unlikely to say that they know many people involved with tea, but they'd also wonder, why are you asking this question? <laughs> because it's that far removed from where most of them are coming from. So the pyramid, the, the economic and social structure pyramid like that, has gradually shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until it's becoming more like a vertical pole than, than a pyramid. So it means that the financial base for all of this is collapsing. Uh, and it's happening very dramatically. Uh, I'm not going to say that uh, it'll mean China Yu will cease to exist. I think will always exist, but it's going to be reshaped and reformed and have a very different role to play and, and a very different economic and social function in the future. But this isn't just tea, it's all of the practices around it, which is architecture, it's painting, it's uh, uh, making cast iron key, tea kettles, all kinds of ceramics, uh, uh, all kinds of things, paper, kimono, uh, and tatami, all kinds of things uh, have been largely surviving on the basis of tea patronage. And since the tea patronage is disappearing, all of these crafts are highly endangered now. And this is what I'm, I'm going to be talking about. Uh, this isn't much in the news yet, but people that are closely connected to these things are very well aware of it, and it's, it's happening more radically all the time. So in the old uh, world, we have these wonderful uh, uh, tea houses, but of course, even the idea of a tea house shows what a real high uh, level of culture we're talking about. I mean, economic culture, because to have a tea house, you have to have a place big enough for a tea house. But a tea house really isn't a tea house without a tea garden. And, and then you have all of these other kinds of things. So even to ha have this, or to maintain it, or have the space, is a really very extremely high uh, social uh, position in the past and in today. It's actually higher today because even the old wealthy families are shrinking and shrinking and moving into smaller and smaller uh, quarters. And so, uh, uh, not just uh, the idea of a tea house, but even the idea of a tokenoma or a painting alcove that a tea uh, a ceremony normally revolves around is becoming an increasingly rare architectural um, format. This change in tea culture is seen and reflected in all kinds of ways. If we look at publications about tea, this is uh, uh, this one central rack of books is a about uh, matcha, China Yu uh, instruction books. This is from the Kinakunia bookstore in Osaka. It's one of the biggest bookstores in Osaka. I took this about a month ago. But if we went back in time 30 years ago, not just to the biggest ones, we would find areas much larger than this with all kinds of lavish books, uh, photo books, uh, scholarly books, all kinds of books on tea. So this is a, a very uh, uh, drab selection 
of series books, and a lot of these series are actually very old. They're still for sale, but they're not recently published. They may be 20, 30 years old. Uh, and these are all different aspects of tea ceremony activity broken down into different uh, volumes. And they're still very useful if you're doing it, but, but uh, it may look like a lot if you're an American, you're not seeing much, or you're saying, oh, there's all these breakdown of detailed specialized forms. But compared to what used to exist even a few decades, this is just a piddling of the, of the publishing world is involved with it. These are some more recent books and include, it's a series, but it has some more uh, specialized uh, uh, scholarly aspects of different parts of tea. Uh, I say scholarly, although this is still meant for a general audience, but it's uh, uh, a little more specialized. But it's just a dribble of what used to be there. So what's happening with the tea markets, with the utensils, with when you have this uh, uh, shrinking pyramid that's getting more and more like a vertical pole, what happens to all the tea teachers? Well, the old tea teachers are growing old and, uh, and older, and uh, I know uh, a number of the people that were at the very upper strata of the tea world in Kyoto, some of them that were at the center are no longer doing it because uh, due to age they can't do the the leg positions that are required for tea, some, and they say, oh, well, there's chairs and you can do other kinds of formations, but said, if you're doing it that way, tea doesn't have any meaning, so rather than do that, they've just stopped. Uh, and a lot of the old tea teachers don't have the high level students anymore to pass on. So, and the, even the members of the family aren't interested, they have collections of utensils, uh, uh, they're sort of dumping them on the market all at once, and even though the market for it is very uh, weak. And this is from an auction house showing tea bowls uh, with boxes and other kinds of implements. This is Raku tea bowl here. And uh, th these uh, bowls will have uh, uh, a, a pedigree, a history written on the box. And these used to be very expensive. When I was first in Japan in the 70s, bowls like this, uh, uh, a low-level one with a good pedigree might have been five or six thousand dollars. Higher-level ones would be twenty, thirty thousand, and the upper-level ones could even be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, but those um, and anonymous bowls, but of quality, with maybe without a box or no tradition, might be like if it was a nice Raku bowl, maybe 18th, uh, early 19th century, but no pedigree, might have been three or four thousand dollars in the 1970s. Uh, now, in auction places like this, uh, bowls with good pedigrees by well-known people are sometimes a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars. In other words, the price has dropped so low that it's lower maybe a third of what anonymous things were uh, 30 years ago, which is a whole revolutionary slide in values. This is not only happening to traditional walls, this is, these are the um, bamboo um, uh, containers for chashaku, the, the, the tea scoops for uh, doling out the, the matcha, and they're inscribed by who did them and so forth, and these are antique, and you can, these are the prices here, are the minimum bid prices, they're about one to two thousand dollars, which seems like a, a lot maybe if you don't know the tea world, but uh, given that these are named works associated with known uh, tea masters, they're uh, bargain basement uh, prices compared to what they used to be. Uh, and in these auction areas, they'll put out hundreds of bowls, and they have all of these things and from prices 20, 30 years ago. But at, what are the sales? In some cases, almost none of them sold. Uh, not just at one sale, but in sale after sale. And so it's an uh, uh, incredible uh, reflection of these are uh, chai ray, these are the ceramic containers for the powdered uh, tea. Uh, these are natsume, these are used in sum summer for uh, the containers in the ceremony for powdered tea. Cast iron kettles of all kinds uh, from uh, late Edo back into early, uh, or, or rather late Muromachi. Uh, and the, the lids give you uh, the history of the bowl and some of the technical terminology for the shapes and designs. Uh, even uh, th this is the lacquer frame for the, the row or the hearth uh, that you have a, a, can set in these uh, elaborate uh, lacquer uh, 
works. So I'm, I'm showing you a range of things because it's not just ceramics or one thing, but all kinds of different craftspeople that, whose whole careers and livelihood was based upon the high values uh, gotten from tea production. Uh, that's all disappearing. So all of those craftspeople are diminishing their economic future is extremely uncertain. And, and we're talking with, uh, as you can see here, very high levels of craftsmanship. If we look at tea stores themselves, we, it's a bit different because the matcha basis of their existence is only uh, partial, you know. So one of the most famous uh, stores in Kyoto is Ippodo, uh, and it still has a traditional uh, store here, though they keep remodeling the interior. Uh, this is, this has store has about a 250 year history uh, and is one of the more prominent ones and sells all over Japan. Uh, they still show the old uh, tea jars. Matcha was, uh, when it was, after it was uh, picked, it was slightly treated and then sealed in these uh, jars for about a half a year and then after that waiting period were opened and then ground after uh, about a half year of uh, waiting and there were ceremonies around the opening of this and, and there lots of uh, other kinds of things and they preserve these not because they're using them but it's decoration and they were in the shop and you see the old tea uh, boxes down there on the floor. Uh, this is their price list. If you look up at the right, uh, the, the one on the right is uh, the, the matcha. So you see, uh, all the, of course, it's vertical going from right to left. Those are prices for 40 gram uh, amounts uh, of matcha. And you can see all of these different types of matcha. There, there, there must be about 15 or 16 different uh, uh, grades of matcha uh, there. But the actual amount of their sales being matcha would be uh, much smaller than the number of uh, wares. Most people are going there to buy uh, uh, gyokuro and sencha. Gyokuro is a kind of high-grade sencha that was developed in the 19th century. Uh, the basic, th it's really processed much like uh, uh, sencha. It's a kind of sencha, but the, they uh, cover the leaves for more weeks, uh, and it gives it a higher quality, uh, a more delicate uh, flavor, and a higher price. And so you can see the tenkaichi is their most expensive, and that's about $100 for 100 grams. Uh, there can be more expensive uh, 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 senchas than that, but for this store, this, that's their highest grade. They don't sell very much of it, but it's, it's there. It's mostly in the grades that are about three or 4,000 yen and lower uh, that uh, are the biggest sellers for that. And then over on the left, we see the banchas uh, there, uh, which is a, a rougher kind of, a very good kind of uh, tea, but it's made with old leaves and stems and has very little caffeine, which means you can drink it in any quantity. Uh, they show samples. Here, here's the samples of the sencha. You can see the tenkaichi over on the right, um, and uh, it gives you some idea of the visual differences uh, between the different grades of uh, sencha. But uh, those kinds of uh, uh, tea uh, uh, sales outlets are are uh, still there. There's uh, numbers of old uh, tea companies still functioning in, in Kyoto, but there are new ones coming up. This uh, Lupicia that uh, is being spread around Japan and now has international outlets. Uh, they uh, really focusing on world tea. They're based in Japan, and so maybe 20, 25% of their teas are Japanese-based teas, but the, they pride themselves of having uh, both traditional and new types of teas from all over the, the world. And this is a store that's just a few blocks away on the same street uh, as the Ipado in uh, Kyoto. It, this opened just a few years ago. As you can see there, there's English signs that are really um, trying to appeal to the foreign tourist market in, in Kyoto. Uh, this is the inside, so they're trying to give this Oshari elegant kind of uh, appearance. On the far wall there, you see sort of a shelf running down there. There's around 150 different types of world teas being uh, sold here. And again, about 20% or so are Japanese, and the rest are from all over. Uh, uh, to give an idea, for, for matcha, they may have two kinds. For sensor, they may have three kinds. So if I was a tea buyer in, in, in Kyoto, I wouldn't 
really want to go there to buy matcha or sencha, you'd want to go to Ipodo, which has a much bigger arrangement. On the other hand, you can get teas from all over the place here, uh, many different types of Chinese teas, Indian teas, Russian teas, all kinds of different types of uh, tea that they package in different way. It's interesting, they display them in these little canisters so that you can actually open the canister and handle and smell the tea. Uh, and so that's kind of a nice feature of their, their sales display. And they have a, a description of the tea uh, below. And, uh, and this is what's running along the, the rack there on the one side of the, of the building. And so you have these uh, different categories Uh, every time I've gone there, there's been a fair number of people there. They seem to be, you know, doing a reasonably good business without maybe making a, lots of money, but still it seems an active uh, place and they're clearly trying to promote tea in sort of non-traditional ways. It's really the non-traditional uh, ways of tea promotion that are having so much effect. Uh, this is a little... Uh, uh, hard to see. These are two photographs that have been put together. Uh, uh, the store is just called Matcha here, um, or the Matcha Khan, uh, and this is the exterior. Uh, they call it a Matcha Khan, and you can actually go there and have the whipped uh, uh, matcha tea, but most of the products there are ice cream, and what people are lining up for, and the reason the photograph's there, it's a little hard to interpret it because it's a uh, a crowded uh, street. So these people on the left side here are just walking down the street. But over here, going way back here, there must have been about 30 people in line waiting a long time because this store was full. I, I questioned them and said, well, what are you waiting for? You know, this is a matcha con. What, what are you buying? They were all wanting uh, matcha tiramisu. <laughs> and it is being uh, served in a, in a wooden uh, uh, sake uh, uh, container. There's a, a square wooden sake uh, box. It's an old style uh, for drinking sort of raw sake. And, and instead of putting sake in it, they put in uh, uh, matcha flavored tiramisu. <laughs> and every, it's become an explosive popular item for this store. So every day you go by, there's like 20 or 30 people waiting all the time to get in there. And everybody's totally ignoring the matcha in, in, in the traditional form and want the tiramisu. Uh, but this shows the search for new markets and new products and so forth that are drawing people's curiosity uh, in the current tea uh, world. So uh, KitKat. Uh, KitKat uh, has become very big in selling all kinds of uh, uh, matcha products, uh, mostly not for Japanese but for foreign tourists. So you find them at airports or tourist-oriented things will be doing, they'll also have hojicha, kocha, uh, KitKat, and uh, other types of things. There's a, a, a movie that just came out that's called Uso Hapyaku that's about uh, uh, shifty de dealings in Chanyu ceramics. It's a comedy film. Uh, it's about a fake uh, uh, black Chawan attributed to Rikyu with connections to Hideyoshi, and there's it's a very complicated plot where cheaters are cheating cheaters are cheating other cheaters and, and there's all this kind of uh, 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 stuff. If you know something about the world it's uh, of uh, antique forgeries and stuff, it's, it's entertaining. I went to it not only because it was, uh, it's in the theaters right now, uh, not only because it was tea related but because I want to see who's coming to see this film. Because you know? I figured this film, given the state of Tay now, is not going to be that popular. But it, they had quite a large audience. But the large audience, I would say probably the, the average age of the people in the audience is about 70. <laughs> but un unlike a lot of 70-year-old movie audience, nobody was going to sleep. Uh, everybody was laughing and highly involved with this. And I think these people that were going there, the same people that are watching a very popular form, Japanese form of antiques roadshow that's called Kante Dan in, in Japan, where it travels around Japan and people bring out of their attics and, or Kura uh, their um, you know, family treasures and get them evaluated. And this age group is really into that program and I think those people were going there and having a great time uh, looking at this and laughing a lot. But this is, you know, uh, it's showing the, the high, uh, high tea cultures, now the lowbrow <laughs> tea comedy. Uh, 
this is just a, a map of tea production in Japan to show that it's really, the blue areas are where tea is basically not grown, but the other colors are there, and then you see uh, amounts in tonnage and acreage there for different parts of Japan. It's an interesting map, you can find it online, uh, but uh, just to show that tea production, if you're looking at overall production, is sort of evened off, and it's not, it shifts a little bit, uh, year to year, so it's not like tea is disappearing in Japan, but the cultural status and its position, and it's certainly its relation to all this complex of art, artistic and craft production is changing radically, even though uh, 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 the overall production, uh, just in mass quantity and acreage, isn't shifting too dramatically. But ultimately, we were left with this question, you know. We have uh, the tea culture of the past, and that's an entry uh, uh, way uh, full of Shibui qualities to a, a famous tea garden on the left. And here is uh, Dotonbori Osaka with contemporary culture of a month ago. You know, can these, uh, you know, exist together? Uh, I'm not saying that tea is ever going to disappear in the classical sense, uh, but it's going to shrink and, uh, and the biggest uh, problem is it could rapidly devolve into something that is so small that you just see it in cultural museums or other kinds of things and, and the prices uh, go sky uh, rocketing for the few people that can still afford it. Uh, on the other hand, if you're wanting to collect uh, uh, everything from imperial calligraphies, because the main use of imperial calligraphies was in tea ceremonies. People aren't doing it. And if I can just have 30 seconds more to explain what, because this shows how how serious the price problem is. Imperial calligraphies, these are calligraphies, as its name sounds, done by emperors. They were the highest level kind of uh, thing you could display in a tea, tea uh, room. They used to be extraordinarily expensive. The price has dropped and dropped and dropped. People aren't buying them. I thought that uh, usually if something has been very highly valued and expensive, the price drops. If it drops far enough, people that have always wanted one at some point will start buying them and you'll have a new base and then it'll start creeping up again. I thought that would happen. It didn't happen. It's still falling like a rock. And so uh, talking to a lot of tea people and to uh, high level antique stores, why is it falling like a rock? It happens because um, even if you could have the money now to buy a fine, maybe even late Muramachi imperial calligraphy with a wonderful mounting, according to the very strict rules maintained by most tea schools, if you hang uh, imperial calligraphy for a tea ceremony, it's improper to uh, conduct such a ceremony unless all the materials being used are at that same level. Uh, in other words, you can't use your everyday materials with an imperial calligraphy. You'd have to buy imperial level uh, comma. You'd have to buy imperial level this and this. And, and so it, it's prohibitive. So even people want it, they don't buy it. Uh, and this is happening in lots of things so that there's, uh, there's a disturbing free fall happening. And uh, where it's going to end is not quite clear at the moment. So in uh, any case, uh, I'll be happy to entertain your questions later. Thank you.